invite the very reverend Dr. Andrew McGowan to the podium. Please welcome Andrew. Thank you, uh, both Angela Bauer and Frank Fonaro, for your uh, generous welcome and introduction, and you and also the, uh, the faculty and the rest of the community of the Episcopal Divinity School for this uh, opportunity to give the Kellogg Lectures uh, for this year. In doing so, I also want to acknowledge the generosity of Francis Kellogg and Howard Kellogg, whose support of this school and its Philadelphia predecessor is one of the reasons that these lectures are, are named. Uh, if you uh, have gone, as I have done, to look back over the history of the Kellogg Lectures and you see some of the people who have given them, um, you, you get into that sort of uh, realm called imposter syndrome. Have you heard of that? Um, because it's a who's who of uh, Christian theological scholarship, especially in the, in the progressive side, and I count it a great honour to be uh, invited. Uh, this place also has an important part in my own history and in my heart, and it's a wonderful thing to come back and to visit and to see uh, both old friends and new. <coughs> we all know what sacrifice is, right? <coughs> well, to define it may not be straightforward, but to recognise it is easier. We know a sacrifice when we see one. Parents make sacrifices to buy good things for their children or to send them to particular schools. Lovers make sacrifices of their own ambitions for the sake of common dreams. Soldiers offer their lives for the sake of a country or a cause. Beneath those rather diverse situations and stories, however, lies a common structure or logic. If sacrifice were a sentence, it would not only have its own grammar, but would have a single meaning which is translated into different contexts. Given that we're uh, across the Charles River from a place of serious cultural significance, I want to offer you one other example for thinking about this. <laughs> the observant will see that my memories of the Red Sox date to a particular period, or the most uh, passionate ones at least. Baseball reveals the character of sacrifice quite neatly through that particular play and rule known as the sacrifice fly. The sacrifice fly is a play wherein the batter lofts the ball high into the outfield, knowing that it will be caught and that his turn at bat, uh, a life of sorts in the game that is the world of baseball, that his life in that sense, his inning will be over. Yet by playing the ball thus, he allows another runner already on base to advance after the ball is caught, perhaps even to score a run for the team. Now, this play sacrifice reveals the character of all sacrifices quite neatly. The offering subject gives up something dear to them for the sake of another or of a group or of the greater good. The something matters. Anyone can make a sacrifice, but some offerings are more genuinely sacrificial than others. It is life itself that is most definitively given in sacrifice. It is a symbolic life on the baseball diamond, represented but not exhausted in various other smaller voluntary losses or diversions of material goods away from more immediate or hedonistic uses. And of course, that other common use of the term with which we are familiar takes the question of the giving up of a life for a community or a greater good to a much more concrete endpoint. A gift that costs the giver little or nothing is no sacrifice, however much it benefits the recipient. And the object of sacrifice, that which is sought and gained, must be more than one form of good substituted for another of equal value. If it is really a sacrifice we're talking about, but uh, there must be some end to which the giver is called to serve. Child over parent, other over self, community over individual, and of course, God over all. So while sacrifices can be greater or lesser, 
and they can be symbolic or playful as well as literal or visceral. The archetype and the fulfillment are clear. Sacrifice must be altruistic and it can or perhaps must in its deepest or ideal sense be deadly. Even the economic flesh wounds of philanthropy in which this language is sometimes applied can really only be uh, sacrificial if something is lost and if there is a taste of loss or death for the giver in making the gift. I'm now about to tell you that that elaborate setup is completely wrong. <laughs> we think we know what sacrifice is, and in a real sense we do know what sacrifice is, and therein lies the problem. For deadly altruism, which is the phrase I'm going to use, or one of two phrases I'm going to use to describe that particular complex of ways of thinking about gifts which disadvantage or uh, fatally wound the giver, Deadly altruism is not what sacrifice meant in the writings of the Bible or in the rituals of the temples of the ancient Mediterranean cities or in the experiences of the first Christians. Nor does sacrifice mean that in many other cultures, past and present, where there are practices that we would otherwise uh, identify as sacrifices given what we observe about their basic substances and rituals. Part of my contention in these two lectures, in fact, is there was arguably no such thing as sacrifice, either in the sense I've just discussed of deadly altruism, or at least initially in any single idea connecting the great variety of ritual offerings which are observable in the texts, traditions and societies that are at issue, even if we restrict our view to the, uh, the biblical world, as it were, and the texts which have arisen in the world of ancient Judaism and Christianity. I will therefore try to distinguish in what follows in this lecture and the next between sacrifice as it's generally understood, deadly altruism, and the actual practices which have been linked together in relation to such understandings of sacrifice. This general idea of sacrifice already discussed, which I've which I've used the term deadly altruism, I would also prefer to call at a slightly more uh, dispassionate level perhaps sacrificial ideology as opposed to sacrifice itself. Sacrificial ideology is both that general set of ideas described above that I have also named deadly altruism, but it is also the assumption that those uh, practices represent the essence of sacrifice, whether viewed positively or negatively. For while there have been a considerable number and variety of critics of sacrifice, there is also a tendency even for the critics to assume that sacrifice does have a kind of historical essence that has a certain stable, if perhaps in the eyes of many increasingly, a pernicious character. But things that we think to be true are not always so. An ideology refers to the way in which we mistake things that need not be for things that are somehow essential, eternal or given. As Terry Eagleton puts it, ideology seeks to convert culture into nature. Ideology involves a false consciousness that presents things which are in fact arbitrary or at least historically variable and contingent as though they were constant and given. So many critics and theorists across a range of disciplines have pointed with considerable accuracy in some cases to the problem of sacrifice, but in doing so they have often conflated sacrifice itself, the varied practices of ritual and the varied ideas attached in a great variety of historical and cultural contexts, they have often conflated sacrifice itself with sacrificial ideology. In this first lecture I want in particular to pay attention to some of the important critiques that have been raised about sacrifice, even though it may already be apparent that part of what I intend to do is to go past the critiques of sacrificial ideology, as I would suggest it, to think freshly about sacrifice as an actual set of practices. The critique of and the theorising about sacrifice is nearly as old as sacrifice itself, or at least it's as old as any discourse that we have about sacrifices although the rituals themselves may well precede uh, literary societies and literary practices by a considerable time. 
you are all familiar, I suspect, with those prophetic denunciations of sacrifice which ring down the ages and those parts of the Psalms that seem to be rejecting sacrifice or certain forms of it. It's still common, however, for interpreters to ignore the, uh, the persistent evidence that the same texts and authors assumed the existence of the temple cultus and expected a renewal of it under more just and ethical conditions, as, for instance, the Jewish scholar Jonathan Clowans has pointed out in his fairly recent work on purity and sacrifice. My concern here, however, is not so much to consider those ancient critiques as to consider briefly a variety of modern accounts of sacrifice with important elements which we continue to need to take into account, but which also have important limits. Sacrifice has in effect been at the centre of the emergence of what we refer to generally as the social sciences of anthropology and sociology. And uh, figures such as J.G. Fraser, I'm reading from left to right here if you're looking at the mugshots, J.G. Fraser, Robertson Smith, Emile Durkheim and Marcel Mauss, among others, showed across a series of significant studies in the 19th and into the early 20th century how closely the emergence of social theory itself as a discipline has been bound up with the exploration of the phenomenon of sacrifice and also how closely these explorations were founded in close proximity to studies of the Bible and of Israelite religion in particular. Now, while hardly unanimous in detail, the theories of sacrifice that I am uh, somewhat clumsily lumping together as a set of foundational social theories in relation to sacrifice, while hardly unanimous in detail, these theories of sacrifice, which are ostensibly derived from historical and or cross-cultural studies of sacrificial rituals, often have common elements which are curiously akin to aspects of Christian theology rather more than to anything which could arguably derive from the scientific observation of the enormous variety of rituals at hand. Uh, for instance, we often find that the significance of animal victims is prioritised relative to situations where vegetable offerings are made. We often find the notion that uh, animal victims in particular somehow are supposedly hinting at or have been substituted for some human victim who is supposed to lurk in the background of the origins of sacrificial practices. Or sometimes this human victim is imagined in fact to be representing a divine victim. And uh, yes, if you have done any Christology, you might recognise a couple of those elements as things that sound uh, rather familiar. It's also true across the history of this 19th and 20th century scholarship that typically an evolution of sorts is posited from the gross and bloody realities of the rituals of primitive societies to the high-minded, pure and spiritual ethics uh, which are carried around in the hearts of people like Protestants, coincidentally or not, and which carry with them at the highest point of their evolutionary trajectory no blood but only the reality of complete self-giving whether human or divine. Now, these theories have all, of course, been subject to critique by subsequent um, theorists and uh, writers in sociology, anthropology and other disciplines. But it is curious and interesting to me that even the versions of sociology and anthropology that privilege the human victim and the divine victim and the animal victim, as though these somehow reveal the heart of sacrificial ritual to us, are particularly popular in theological circles, even when appeal is being made to sociology or anthropology rather than to theology per se. And the, uh, the recent apostle of these, uh, this set of views is the, uh, the Franco-American social theorist René Girard, uh, active at Stanford for many years, who died just last year. Girard uh, claimed, on the basis of his own anthropological or sociological studies, that sacrifice, and indeed not just sacrifice, but actually religion itself, and even, uh, if that wasn't an ambitious enough theory to start with, society itself, could be explained by suggesting that there were, was an act or acts of primordial violence, of uh, human on human violence, uh, hidden somewhere in the mists of time, inaccessible to historical documentation because it preceded them, but that some act of human rivalry which led to a primordial murder 
was in fact the reason that human societies bonded together and offered sacrifices. And that animal victims were offered again and again because we were afraid that we might start offering each other up if we didn't take chickens, pigs or other convenient substitutes for the mimetic desire and the kind of rivalry that we experience by existing as human beings in society with one another. Girard then at some point, both in his career and also in the course of his theorization, does an interesting kind of slide from anthropology into theology, suggesting that the death of Jesus was itself, historically as well as theologically, a kind of climactic anti-sacrifice, which in the gospel reveals the character of sacrifice as a, a pointless, violent, scapegoating exercise repeated again and again. And by revealing the character of sacrifice in a kind of ultimate sacrifice, a sacrifice par excellence, reveals and ends it. Now, Girard's work, I must say, seems to me much more problematic than it is revealing. Even though there are aspects of his theory about uh, mimetic rivalry and the notion of how desire and imitation can lead to competition and to violence, and this I don't want to dismiss out of hand. But what does seem to me to be revealed in Girard's theory of sacrifice in particular, if unwittingly, is the kind of high point, not of sacrifice, but of the general confusion in classic social theory between what is ostensibly scientific and what is actually theological or at least ideological in character. For I believe that the notion that the ideal or original sacrificial victim is human or divine or whatever version of it we have in so many of these theories of the past century or two, that this uh, idea that the victim who should be sought either as a historic archetype or as represented in particular acts of sacrificial offering, that this is actually nothing more than a crypto-Christian element embedded in Western theories of sacrifice, even on the part of those who have personally given up the Christian commitment that, as it were, culturally led to the prominence of things like the, the self-giving death of the noble person. So too, uh, Girard's observation that oppressive social structures can be ritualized in terms of sacrifice is a theme that is found in other theoretical and theological constructs as well. And this nexus between ritual and violence and oppression is not to be taken lightly, but there may be some more fruitful places to look for what we can learn from that. Another strand or set of strands of sacrificial critique that require, I think, more careful and more serious attention uh, have been found in a set of feminist discourses. And these are rather varied and hard to summarize adequately, but I simply want to offer two examples which I think have uh, a measure of local relevance to this group, but which are also, also worth considering to think about how theories of sacrifice have worked. One of the more interesting studies of sacrifice in relatively recent years is found in Nancy Jay's book, Throughout Your Generations Forever, Sacrifice, Religion and Paternity, which began as a Brandeis University doctoral thesis and was published posthumously after Jay's untimely death in 1992. Jay traces in a series of case studies how societies as diverse and far-flung as ancient Israel, the 19th century Ashanti Kingdom, and the modern Roman Catholic and Anglican churches have all used sacrificial ritual and discourse to construct paternity and patriarchy. Together and separately, her case studies remain a significant contribution to the exploration of how sacrifice functions or might function. It is not a flaw so much as a definition or a self-limitation of Jay's work that it finds rituals focused on blood sacrifice to have certain characteristics when they are employed for the construction of patriarchy through ritual. But like the other significant contributions in 19th and 20th century sacrificial thought, Jay's book tends to assume what sacrifice is with a touchstone that is based very strongly on the notion of violence, and in particular in this case on the importance or significance of bloodletting. Jay is careful to state that she does not seek an essential or universal theory of sacrifice from the cases that she studies. But the commonality drawn from her cross-cultural study has contributed in a sense, uh, rather contributed to the sense in some discourses that bloodletting is what sacrifice is and does. So there's a sense at which it seems to me, despite its importance, in Jay's work, sacrifice and what I've called sacrificial ideology, 
which may not be the same thing as sacrifice, are arguably conflated. I offer one other example of a significant feminist critique for considering further critical thinking about sacrifice, and this one with a more theological tone. Uh, the local interest here is that uh, Rita Nakashima Brock uh, shared in her 2003 Kellogg lectures some of the material which was later published in her book jointly with Rebecca Parker, Saving Paradise, in which they developed some ideas further from their earlier 2001 book, Proverbs of Ashes in which they uh, provide an exemplar, uh, not a unique one by any means, but an exemplar of a more specifically theological critique of how emphasis upon the death of Jesus as an ideal which people should emulate uh, is then figured in terms of sacrifice and the language and theology of atonement and has functioned to present women in particular, but not exclusively, with oppressive models that have dictated the acceptance of suffering as a sort of necessary ethical lesson. So for instance, of the medieval women mystics and um, Catherine of Siena in particular, Brock writes, one finds in mystics of the time, including Catherine, great literature that extols peace and expresses profound compassion for the suffering of Christ. The bloody underbelly of such piety was the support for wielding the sword for Christ, killing evildoers, and seeking self-annihilation in ecstasies of dying love. To fulfill her sacrifice to God, Catherine starved herself to death. Like Jay's, Brock's critique is, I think, in general terms, to be accepted and presumed. But I will note again the problem of what sacrifice is assumed to be in Brock's account of Catherine of Siena's death. And while this is readily identifiable as an instance of what is being treated here as sacrificial, sacrificial ideology, you will note that in thinking about how Catherine uh, ad adopts an extreme form of asceticism as the embodiment of her self-annihilation, that we are no longer talking about anything much that any uh, ancient Israelite, uh, Greek or Roman, or any Christian of the first few centuries would have understood as having anything to do with sacrifice. There is no ritual here. There is no victim except a kind of extended hypoth hypothetical or metaphorical one. Um, what makes Catherine's actions sacrificial, and this may have been true in her own understanding, by the way, and I'm not simply saying this is Brock's, but what makes Catherine's actions sacrificial is their self-destructiveness as much or more than anything that they have to do with being a gift. So here again, I think we have evidence of the, the fact that by uh, the time of Catherine's uh, writing and thinking that sacrificial ideology in the sense that I have outlined it is well in place. And finally, I want to note that there is a further range of theological voices which have made somewhat related moves that assume the character of sacrifice as violent annihilation, self-annihilation or the annihilation of the other, more or less independent of ritual and therefore unsurprisingly reject it. And this is sometimes a characteristic of certain forms of um, left-wing Protestantism, for instance, which use the notion of sacrifice as a way of criticizing war. And so the, the peace church tradition is a particular place we might see this. So for instance, um, Stanley Hauwas uh, uh, makes this observation. The sacrifices of war are undeniable but in the cross of Christ, the Father has forever ended our attempts to sacrifice to God in terms set by the city of man sick. That's my sick, not his, you gathered that. Christians have now been incorporated into Christ's sacrifice for the world so that the world no longer needs to make sacrifices for tribe or state or even humanity. But just as Catherine's self-annihilation through fasting would have been understood to have little or nothing to do with sacrifices as offered by people who actually do practice ritual offerings, so too how was uh, assumption that war itself can be identified as a or perhaps even the definitive form of sacrifice is a great distance from the notion of anything that would have passed for sacrifice in the ancient world or in biblical texts. So in terms reminiscent of Girard, uh, how was both links something like violence or war in general to sacrifice and then opposes it to the death of Jesus, which is understood uh, to be the basis of solving as well as revealing the problem of sacrifice.
In the last few examples, I've offered voices united at least by their criticism of sacrifice, if quite diverse in their specific expressions of how and why it must be exposed or rejected. How are wasp views sacrifice as necessary in a positive sense, but historically superseded? Girard views it as unavoidable historically, but as pernicious and requiring exposure and abolition. Both of these, however, see the cross of Jesus as somehow a sort of sacrifice par excellence that affects the necessary shift and change. On the other hand, Nancy Jay, writing as a social interpreter, and Rita Brock as a theologian, are, like Girard, more unflinching in their criticism of sacrifice per se, but would not make an exception of the death of Jesus as somehow freeing Christian tradition from its thrall, but rather tending to see it as an exemplar of the sacrificial problem rather than as a means of transcending it. Now, these different views uh, all uh, demand further attention than they can be given in a context like this. But it is what they actually share that I want to note and then to critique further. Namely, the assumption that violence, violence itself, and for most of these in particular, the death of Jesus, exemplify what sacrifice is, whether positively or negatively. I do not contend that the death of Jesus has been unimportant for the emergence of sacrificial ideology. In fact, uh, I will go on to say something more to the contrary, that it's essential to the way in which sacrificial ideology has actually been formed in Western thought. But as I have already hinted, the differences between sacrifice as an actual set of rituals with diverse meanings, purposes and settings, and sacrificial ideology are typically insufficiently acknowledged in all of these instances, in all of these critiques. So to put it slightly more generally, if it is assumed that sacrifice actually means deadly altruism, violent self-abnegation for a, a greater good, then the consequences for historical inquiry and textual interpretation are either that the evidence to be considered is limited to cases in which these characteristics are actually manifest, and hence predetermined by the interpreter to fulfil the ideal type of deadly altruism, which I probably don't have to uh, tell you is a form of circularity. Or, and perhaps more commonly, that other evidence, uh, because it is somehow otherwise identified as sacrificial, is assumed to participate in the universal characteristics of violence and self-annihilation, even if they are not actually evident in the ritual practices themselves or the understandings attached to those rituals by the practitioners. No, rather, have we got a grand theory for you. You may think that your sacrifices are about something else, but we know what they're really about, deadly altruism. And herein, of course, lies a problem. For I suggest that it is not the case at all that ritual offerings that we might otherwise identify as sacrifices on the basis of fairly simple descriptive criteria, that it is not the case at all that there is a universal or transcendent essence of sacrifice per se, let alone that there is a universal and transcendent essence of sacrifice, which is the equivalent of what I've described as sacrificial ideology. A more careful examination of ancient Israelite religion, which has an undeniable significance for theological purposes as well as serving as a particularly interesting historical case in point, and so to a study of other ancient Mediterranean religion, which is significant for how early Christianity emerges and begins to use cultic and sacrificial language to think about its own life and practice. These reveal in particular, I think, that this sort of definition is without foundation. Uh, I suggest that, that the set of offering practices that we find historically and cross-culturally do not reflect a single essence but rather that there is a variety of practices which we uh, connect with one another because of what Ludwig Wittgenstein called family resemblances, the sort of things we recognise between one action or one process or one ritual and another, which allow us to say that something is a game, for instance, to, to take the example he discusses himself more directly. Sacrifice is also a matter of family resemblances, which encourage interpreters to view them as having affinity but then can sometimes lead on without sufficient critical thought to the assumption that affinity also means essential similarity. Now, this alternative observation that sacrifice doesn't mean deadly altruism and that it doesn't actually mean very much at all necessarily uh, may not be immediately convincing to those of you who are properly concerned about the ways in which sacrificial thinking and practice has been used in a variety of uh, political and theological contexts. 
and my case, I know, requires some further demonstration as well as further reflection. After all, if we simply define sacrifice differently, if you choose my broader definition rather than one other narrow one, we have not necessarily solved the problem of circularity. You've simply started a different circle. But in fact, while I will argue that there is no necessary essence of sacrifice, contra Girard in particular and others, this means that the problem of sacrificial ideology still remains. And that, I think, is the significant political and theological problem with which we must wrestle, but that stricter and more careful historical consideration of sacrificial practices changes the character of the problem and the ways we may approach it. Because if sacrifice is not a universal phenomenon with one essence of deadly altruism, but a historically formed and uh, different sets of ideas, then it becomes available for critical inquiry in a new and different way. To demonstrate this claim, I want to give uh, a slightly closer uh, bit of attention, but a necessarily brief overview to the offering practices in everyone's favourite book of the Hebrew Bible, that one that you fell asleep reading when you tried as a 13-year-old to read the whole thing from cover to cover. Yes, it's the book Leviticus. <laughs> there is no word for sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible. There are numerous words for particular rituals that we might call sacrifices because of features that we recognise in the rituals that accompany them. There is no linguistic commonality, however, between the different words which are used to describe the things that we might otherwise lump together as sacrifices or offerings, and which hapless translators of Leviticus into English always must resort to in order to try and convince us and themselves that there really is such a thing as sacrifice or offering which really joins them all together. However, the Pentateuch in general, and in particular Leviticus and its sources, do offer evidence for a construction, or what I would prefer to call, um, a little provocatively perhaps, the invention of sacrifice, by which I do not mean the origins of ritual practices themselves, but the origins of a single idea which is somehow supposed to convince us to regard them as part of a certain whole. It is a sacrificial, sacrificial ideology, I would suggest, we find in Leviticus, but it's not the same as the modern one not the same as the one about deadly altruism. But nonetheless, Leviticus, I think, may provide us with the oldest evidence we have for attempts to link different rituals and to start to find something like a single idea of sacrifice within them. Now, there are sacrifices in the Pentateuch before you get to Leviticus. These were probably the parts that did keep you awake as you started off, not only because they're in Genesis, which is closer to the beginning, but also because their stories connected with them are sometimes a little more interesting. The first actions which we usually identify as sacrifices in the Bible are those things that Cain and Abel do uh, when they uh, take the fruit of the ground, quote, and the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions respectively, and uh, bring them to God. No ritual is described for these gifts that Cain and Abel make. They are both referred to using the Hebrew word mincha, which is elsewhere in scripture used to refer to tribute offered to uh, an overlord, for instance. Uh, but it does re reappear in the Levitical accounts of sacrifice, as we'll see shortly. But it seems to me that uh, because there is no altar, no priest, no ritual described other than the implication that somehow the vegetarian Abel, as they apparently still are at this point, brings the fat portions of the firstlings of his flock. There is otherwise no implication that this is a ritual at all. This might simply be tenant farmers bringing produce to their divine overlord. Yet, of course, something else happens in that story too, doesn't it? Cain murders Abel. And the fact that Cain murders Abel colludes with interpretive presuppositions about the place of violence and sacrifice to suck the text into various vortices of interpretive cultic fantasy on the part of modern readers. Sarah Coakley in her 2012 Gifford lectures, for instance, wants to acknowledge properly that sacrifice involves, quote, a host of complex ideas and that not all, quote, are necessarily present in any one cultural and religious context. And these we should strongly affirm, I believe. But she then defines the range of meanings within which uh, sacrifice might fall as defined by the poles of, guess what, <coughs> violence, and altruism, the two exact components of sacrificial ideology. Before going on to state that, quote, 
almost from the opening of the Hebrew Bible, we are in the thick of this dense nexus of sacrificial association. Cain slays Abel, and the mysterious moral problems about the relation of destruction and offering immediately start to unravel. This is a remarkable statement, given that if there is a sacrifice in that story, it actually involves the fruit of the earth and the fatlings that are nearby lying next to the body of murdered Abel, not to his own death. And the connections that we make with Abel and sacrifice have more to do, I think, with later Christological readings into Abel as the righteous sufferer and victim. There is perhaps a sacrifice in this story, but Abel is not it. If you kept reading in Genesis and your um, adept, uh, enthusiastic 13-year-old mind was still there in chapters 9 and 10, the first altar appears when Noah builds it after the flood and performs for the first time a different ritual, not mincha, but something called ola, which we translate accurately enough in descriptive terms as a, quote, whole burnt offering. But the word doesn't mean that. It means something like something that rises, perhaps something that ascends to God, apparently referring to the way in which in a whole burnt offering, the substance of the victim is turned into smoke and that ascends to the divinity either as communication or as gift or perhaps very anthropomorphically as meal. Are these the first biblical sacrifices perhaps when Noah gets his altar out? Perhaps, but more famous for most of us is the next mention of the Ola in Genesis 22, where Abraham famously does not offer Isaac as an Ola. Paradoxically, this non-offering is often seen as more significant for what sacrifice means, just as the murder of Cain is often seen as being more significant than the actual offerings of Cain and Abel are seen, that that story is often seen as more significant for what sacrifice is than most actual offerings, because I suspect of that near miss involving a human victim which we are somehow programmed to imagine should be the ideal type of the sacrificial victim. Later in Genesis, oh, I'm, I'm running behind my slides. There's Cain and Abel's Minha and Noah and Abraham's Ola. Later in Genesis, Jacob performs rituals involving drink called a, a Nesek and meat called a Zabach. And this latter case in Genesis 31 is the first case we find where it seems that the making of an offering to God is connected with a feast which is shared on the part of the human participants themselves. Now there are many more rituals such as this if we read through into Exodus. Uh, in Exodus these and other rituals that we would think of as sacrifices are prescribed as part of the dedication of the priests and the tabernacle. We find oil as well as wine being poured out, and we find bread significantly, as well as meat being offered and or shared. These are all in Exodus 29 in the story of the dedication of the tabernacle. All that links these different acts is the apparent context, which is, as the Cain and Abel story indicates, I suspect, which is partly the reader's construction, but which nonetheless overall can probably be agreed to be that an offering to the divinity is being made. The Ola, the whole burnt offering, involves violence and destruction, but the Zebah involves food, and some other sacrifices involve cereal, vegetable foods, and no victim in the sense of uh, animal or blood whatsoever. The first seven chapters of the book Leviticus, however, present a set of instructions for ritual offerings or sacrifices whose location and significance is foregrounded uh, by the Lord's appearance to Moses at the tent of meeting and uh, prescribing to Moses what the sacrificial rituals uh, of the future should be. And of course, we imagine that these are actually retrojected onto the story of the wilderness tabernacle from a later, more permanent um, uh, sanctuary, perhaps the Jerusalem temple itself, or if we date the P source to an earlier date, perhaps to another sanctuary such as Shiloh. Um, but first there is the Ola, totally consumed by fire. Then comes what is called, like Cain's and Abel's tribute, a Minha. Here, however, the tribute desired for the priestly cult is bread, like Cain's offering, not Abel's. It's not blood or flesh. After that comes the Zebach Shalamim, something we're used to calling a peace or communion offering, but which, like Jacob's Zebach of uh, Genesis 31 involves a meal 
Um, there is, therefore, animal slaughter in some cases. There are destructive offerings in certain instances. There are shared offerings in others. These rituals, however, are not linked by their actual names, you will notice. It is our attempt to call them the something sacrifice or the something offering that is stamped upon them in our attempt to create a commonality which does not exist linguistically in the text itself. Leviticus, however, does make its own attempt to impose a kind of conceptual commonality and imposing its own sacrificial theory. And this is by using the familiar word korban. You know this from Mark chapter 7. Jesus is recorded as criticizing a later elite. If anyone tells father or mother whatever support you might have had from me is korban, that is an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on. <clears throat> This term korban does not appear in the Pentateuch prior to its introduction by Leviticus as an attempt to provide for the first time a single overarching idea which can provide a means of uh, linking and interpreting all those other particular rituals. And korban itself, interestingly enough, means approach. It seems that the implication of saying that all these other bits and pieces are really uh, forms of korban is to make a, a theological claim about the location of sacrifice, because these are not things for the, the priestly source that you should go out and do in any old temple or in any old hill, but rather you should do them in the place where the uh, authorised presence of God is sanctioned in the, in the temple itself. So the Levitical sacrificial ideology doesn't seem quite concerned as modern sacrificial ideology does with notions of uh, of a deadly altruism, but it is concerned with saying we have to make sense of sacrifice and it really must mean one thing and what it should mean is that you should all come and offer your sacrifices here and nowhere else. This is a kind of attempt at ancient cultic monopolization. But it is arguably our oldest sacrificial theory, our oldest sacrificial ideology. This is what all these things are and mean and how they derive their significance. So the way that Leviticus groups certain activities together to create a unifying sacrificial ideology of korban is rather different from Jewish and Christian understandings, not only in the sense of uh, what it seems to mean or what the content of the sacrificial ideology is here, but also in terms of what is included. Because I, if I'd given you a piece of paper before we began this conversation, I'd asked you to write down the two or three most significant sacrifices in Israelite religion or Judaism, which of you would not, after the past six weeks or so, have written Passover on that list? But you see, for Leviticus, because the ritual of the Pesach is not something that takes place in the temple, Leviticus arguably does not think that Passover is a sacrifice. Because that is what sacrifice is. It's something that you do when you come to the temple. Sacrifice, in the sense at least of korban, is something that must be done in the priestly cultic context of the centralised sanctuary. And your own homegrown domestic slaughter the lamb yourselves and eat it all with your friends does not cut it for the Levitical ideology of what sacrifice should actually be. So the Pentateuch, and in particular Leviticus, expose the fact that sacrifice is not a single idea or practice, but a way of understanding different religious rituals with various meanings. And with this fairly simple historical example, I submit that many of the theological and social scientific claims of sacrificial ideology, wait for it, go up in smoke. Now I should admit here that there is of course some other definition, a looser or broader one, implicit in my own consideration of these Pentateuchal sources. In the absence of a lexical connection prior to Leviticus, the texts I have considered here walking through Genesis and Exodus, as well as the ones neatly presented to us on the platter of Korban by Leviticus, seem to involve something like making offerings to God. This rather prosaic template may itself need to be interrogated but it avoids at least some of the propositions about both violence and intention. And I want to return to the notion that gift, gift itself, rather than violence, might be the place from which to interpret some reconstruction of sacrificial meaning that goes beyond the merely descriptive. So in this first lecture, I've laid out some dimensions of a problem and have begun 
uh, a sketch, perhaps, of really more the negative elements of a solution that must be adopted before we could find a more positive one. Sacrifice, as we all know it, is sacrificial ideology or deadly altruism. It is not to be confused with a mixture of actual rituals and practices to which the name sacrifice might otherwise be attached if we observe ancient or other contemporary societies in which offering rituals are made. In fact, of the two supposed characteristics or poles, as Sarah Coakley put it, of violence and altruism, violence is sometimes present in some of these stories insofar as there are animal victims which must implicitly be slaughtered in order for their meat to be offered. But that violence is not a defining feature of ancient offerings, which after all include vegetable and liquid offerings of various kinds, as well as animal victims. And if, uh, if violence is only loosely and inconsistently present in these contexts, I want to suggest that altruism is not present at all. Unless you imagine that every giving of a gift is somehow the expression of altruism. And that more complex question we may be able to return to. So, while some of the sacrificial critiques that we've considered are just and necessary, there is a sense in which they may arguably either miss the point or at least need to be taken to another point beyond their insights. If sacrificial, sacrificial ideology and actual sacrifice are two different things or sets of things, then the criticism of ritualised violence and of ideologies that defend or promote self-annihilation or the annihilation of others is profoundly important but it does not tell us so much about sacrifice as it does about violence. What it does tell us is something about how the idea of sacrifice has been formed in the context of Christian tradition and how much it might have to change. And to this, we'll return in the next lecture. Thank you. Um, now, Dean Bauer has encouraged me to handle a, a few minutes of Q&A if you have those questions. My typical answer will be, of course, be, well, that's going to be in the second lecture. But, um, <laughs> but please, I think we have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for such a possibility, if anyone would like to offer a, a question in particular, please. We'll run a mic to you so that others at home can hear. Down the back, thank you. I've been told from folk who are a little bit older than myself that the photograph on the cover of Life magazine at the end of the 1960s with the Buddhist monks self-annihilating themselves, that quote iconic photograph, is what began the beginning of the end of the horrific Vietnam War. In your definition, Professor, would you call that a sacrifice? Um, it's, uh, it, it probably bears some relationship to sacrifice, but I wouldn't call it a sacrifice as such. Um, interestingly, I, I, remember, I remember those events myself as an eight-year-old. Um, you can all do your calculations now. But, um, and I remember it being referred to in the Australian news media as, quote, self-immolation, unquote. And you, some of you may be aware that that phrase self-immolation has come to refer more specifically, if you, look, if you find it used in the news media now, more specifically to acts of people burning themselves alive. Um, but immolation, of course, does literally mean uh, sacrificial offering. So uh, that was how the Western news media read those acts of um, self-annihilating protest. And I think one of the questions I'd want to ask before I gave a more definitive answer to that was to how Vietnamese Buddhism would have understood that action. In other words, was the ritual apparatus of the tradition from which those monks came such that their actions were understood by them to be cultic offerings? Um, in fact, uh, although that language, uh, cultic language was applied to them in the news, it seemed more as though they were acts of political protest like, for instance, the the hunger strikers of, of Northern Ireland of the, of the 1980s, who again would only have been described as sacrifices in the same way Catherine of Siena was. In other words, that they were annihilating themselves for the sake of a higher cause or good. And so my ignorance of Vietnamese uh, Buddhism notwithstanding, my hesitant, my hesitant answer would be no, that's not a sacrifice. Which doesn't tell you anything about whether it was good, bad or important, by the way. <laughs> 
Thank you. That was terrific. Now I want to take a whole course in sacrifice. I've got one for you in the spring of 2016 at Yale Divi 2017 at Yale Divinity School, but I shouldn't be getting into competitive sort of language here, should I? <laughs> Thank um, you. One of the threads that keeps running through my mind as you were speaking was the role of a desire to control the rate of transformation. And it seemed as though time is an element of sacrifice that could be an underlying commonality that one may attempt to make a trade as a transaction, or one may try to keep God from doing something or to encourage God to do something. Could you comment on the role of time in this string? You, you seem to have touched on maybe three different things there, which might all be interesting. but. Uh, by time here, I, you, you also then link that to the notion of uh, transactions, that, that maybe that there is a transaction involved in sacrifice, but what you're trying to buy is time, is that right? When you say, well, how does the time part come into that? What is it that you're transacting with God that has to do with time? What did you mean? I think that sometimes when change happens or transformation happens, a reaction or a reactionary position to it is to make an abrupt something happen. And I think that it's a resistance to evolution and that sacrifice is a, at its heart potentially a mechanism of, whether it's cognizant or not, trying to control God. Well, okay. Um, I think that there are certainly instances where sacrifices look as if they're attempts to control God or to bend God to one's own will. Um, I think that we really find a kind of tension involved in, uh, in biblical literature itself between that kind of notion and perhaps another one, and I'll sort of hint about this, uh, hint at it a bit in the second lecture, but um, it really comes down to the question of, of what gifts are and why we give them. Um, because there are gifts and there are exchanges of commodity and service that we know full well are made because of the expectation of reciprocity, right? And, and there are occasions when, um, you know, I try and use something fairly sort of trivial or innocent. You know, if you go to somebody's house for dinner and you take a bottle of wine and when they come back, you know, two or three times and they still haven't brought you anything, you're confused by the failure of reciprocity there because it seems to have broken down the kind of level of gift exchange that's appropriate to the symmetry of your relationship. On the other hand, um, I think uh, that when a parent uh, or a child, take, take a parent's uh, uh, relationship with a child and, and many other relationships of intimate uh, connection, that, that a gift may be given simply as an expression of the relationship rather than because there's any expectation of any kind of reciprocity. It's simply how you are relative to that person. And I think that both those uh, means of thinking about uh, gift and relationship can be present in the offerings even of the, even of the Hebrew Bible and of, the, of early Christianity. And uh, it's sometimes said that, uh, that Roman religion in particular is characterized by this principle which is appropriately enough uh, phrased in Latin, do ut deis, which means I give that you may give. You know, God, you, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. God, here's a nice chicken for you, please. May I have good crops next year, that kind of thing. But um, I will go on to say in the second lecture that I think that that's, also, that's always possible, but I think that to assume that the sacrificial transaction is always based upon that kind of uh, economic zero-sum game rather than by that open-ended reality of the intimate social bond you know, between the, the, the family member, for instance, that, that we can't assume that it always belongs in one category or the other and that that requires more attention to the particular case. I think that one of the interesting things about Leviticus putting the Ola at the beginning, for instance, uh, of, of its sequence is that it, I think most commentators suggest that it, it, it leads off with this most expensive, destructive, perhaps problematic sacrifice because it's, it's, it's a complete gift. You don't get any of the Ola back. It all goes to God. Whereas if you, have the, if you offer the Zabach, Zabach Shalemim, the peace offering, it's actually, the, it's actually a family barbecue. Uh, a, a portion is offered to God symbolically and the rest is shared. So the Ola is a kind of, uh, a more radical kind of gift. But interestingly enough, unlike the, sin, the, I skipped over some material about the sin and guilt offerings which come later, the Hatat and the Asam, that there is no purpose attributed to the Ola. 
It is simply said that if you're going to offer an ola, here is what you do and here is how you do it. It's not because you've sinned, it's not because you're guilty, it's not because you want something, it's not because you've got something, or it might be any of those. But it simply is a kind of radical statement of the, the relationship of the donor to, to God. It doesn't mean that it takes us out of the realm of attempts to manipulate the divine. And I probably think that that's got as much to do with what we see going on in those prophetic and psalmodic critiques of sacrifice, where, for instance, uh, gifts are being made by the rich who can afford them, or even perhaps gifts are being made of livestock that really belongs to the poor, and, and so forth. And that these, the fact that they are offered as burnt offerings is of no significance to the divine if they're obtained by injustice, or if they reflect relationships which are not predicated upon a full and equal mutual responsibility and acknowledgement of the, of the needs of the community as a whole. I'm sorry, I took a while on, on that one, but we still have another minute for another one, I think. I just want to say that I'm in first year of Masters of Divinity, so this is still all a bit hard to process at times, but this is more a simple question, which is, how do you justify violence in, in sacrifice, and particularly blood violence? Yes, and I take it that by in saying that, you're including violence against animals, for instance. Yes. Um, I'm not necessarily wanting to say that I justify it so much as to say that uh, the justification for violence against animals in sacrifice is the same as the justification of violence against animals in meat eating. And therefore, the moral problem is one of violence against animals rather than about sacrifice, which doesn't mean that sacrifice can be exempted from that question. Um, I, um, I am an omnivore myself, but a reluctant, or at least an, ambi an ambivalent omnivore. Um, and my profoundly unsatisfactory answer to your serious question is this, that an ancient society which at least thought that you might as well ritualise the death of an animal, which was going to actually not form a central part of your diet, but only be uh, the object probably of meals of quite significant festive occasions, and only small ones, that to ritualise the killing of an individual chicken or to wring the neck of your own chicken in your own backyard is a much more honest and positive thing than to eat the chickens that are produced by industrial meat production in our own time. And the treatment of chickens and pigs worry me both in profound ways because uh, I suppose there's a sense in which they seem to me to, to reflect some of the worst of industrialization in, in many ways. Uh, in that, you know, it's pick, pick your objection to industrialized meat production. Is it because they make us sick? Is it because they make the pigs and chickens sick? Is it because they have terrible lives and, you know, with low standards of welfare? Or is it just because we kill them? And that cannot be avoided. But I think that um, 21st century Western society, and I'm not suggesting you were doing this, by the way, please, uh, but 21st century Western society is not in a strong position to sneer at the ritualization of occasional violence against animals relative to the, uh, the secularized violence against animals which undergirds so much of our food economy. But thank you for the thought, and I think you know the the vegetarian question is is one that must always be there. It's it's also interesting, by the way, that both in Greek and to some extent, I guess, in Israelite religion, there are people here who know more about this, and I've been taking my life in my hands the last hour. Um, but also in early Christianity, we find a number of cases where the preference for a vegetarian diet is linked to unease about sacrifice, as perhaps more than about concern for animals in the modern sense of, of concern for them as creatures with whom we have an affinity, which is not something one finds a lot of in ancient literary sources. It just pops up occasionally. <clears throat> I want us all to thank Professor McGowan for this amazing first lecture.